Hi, my name is James Cathrall, founder of Cathrall Audio, and I want to make sure you don't get scammed when buying your XLR cables. Even in the year 2023, the audio world will try to sell you snake oil, where you'll find things like this. There's nothing in the world that can convince me that this three foot XLR cable is worth $3,750. They're trying to tell you that this cable will get you an audio signal that has 250 times more value than this standard three foot XLR cable off of Sweetwater. Now, I've blurred out any identifying information because the point is not to call out any specific company since there are many companies doing things like this. It's about having a discussion on what to look out for before you spend your money. So. Let's talk about the value of an XLR cable and what to look for when you're shopping for one. On the surface, it can be a bit confusing. I know it definitely was for me when I first started out. Why is one XLR cable more expensive than the other? They're all basically the same thing, right? It's just some copper wiring and some shielding wrapped up in an outer rubber jacket. There are two things you'll be looking for when buying cables build quality and audio quality. When it comes to build quality, the main factor is the connector. The gold standard of connectors is the Neutrik, but there are other great connector manufacturers out there. Another thing to look for in build quality is the soldering connection of the wires. And lastly is the weight and gauge of the cable. But in my research for this video, it seemed like there wasn't a consensus on the importance of wire gauge for XLR cables, and there's not a ton of variance in that anyway, so it seems like it's of a little bit less importance compared to the others. Now, when considering build quality, the importance of all of these factors will depend on your use case of the cables. If they're for a more permanent installation where you'll basically plug it in once and it'll stay there for months or years at a time, then this may not be as important. But if you'll be using these in an outdoor setting or plugging them in and unplugging them frequently, then build quality will be much more important. Next is audio quality. Now, unlike microphones, XLR cables won't affect the tone or character of the sound, especially not in a pleasing way where someone might want a specific cable because of the way it colors the sound. Cable quality can affect things like noise floor or EMI interference. The noise floor is pretty straightforward. It's the fuzzy white noise you'll hear coming out of your headphones or speakers. There are many things that can contribute to this. So, if you have a lot of noise in your signal, it's probably not specifically your XLR cables that are causing it, but it can be a contributing factor to take into account. EMI is electromagnetic interference. This usually comes out as a hum or a buzz in your signal. It's most often caused by power cables that are too close to your audio cables. Things like laptop and phone chargers as well as any power cables for your gear. Now, this wouldn't be a very fun video if we didn't do some real world testing to see all of this happen in real time. I have four cables with me. They're all five foot Hosa XLR cables at different price points. This is the MBL, which costs $10.95. This is the MCH, which costs $14.95. This is the HMIC, which also costs $14.95. And this is the MSC, which costs a whopping $36.95. I've taken some recordings using each cable and put them in Logic Pro to analyze a few different things. First will be the noise floor, then their EMI rejection abilities, and also a brief talking test swapping the cables on the same microphone to see if there are any audible differences. Finally, the most fun part, especially for me, I'm gonna cut each of these cables open to check out what's actually inside each one of them. These cables were sent to me courtesy of Romeo Music. For full transparency's sake, they didn't have any other involvement in this video outside of sending me these cables. So, thank you for sending these over to help make this video happen. I'll put a link to their website in the description and definitely consider checking them out for any of your audio needs. So, starting with the noise floor. So when looking at these audio analyses, we're gonna be looking at the RMS and the peak. So the peak would be the true highest value of the audio waveform, and then the RMS is closer to how our ears perceive the true loudness of the audio waveform. These signals also have been boosted just to make it a little bit clearer to hear them. You can also take a listen to the different characters of these noise floors and the white noise that's being created that I thought was also kind of interesting between the different cables. Next, for EMI, I'm gonna use this brick from my MacBook charger. It's plugged into an outlet and also the laptop, so there's a current running through it right now, and I'm gonna run it over the XLR cable to see how it handles the electromagnetic interference. 
This next one's really subtle, so I highly suggest wearing headphones to hear all of the small differences for what we're listening for. So you'll notice that the lower end and the lower priced microphones will get more of that hum as I'm hovering that laptop charger over the cable. And then as we get to the more expensive cable, it has better rejection of that EMI, so you don't hear nearly as much of the hum. Now, for the talking test, just to see if there's an audible difference between any of these. This is an audio talking test of the XLR cables to see if there are any audible differences. So, it looks like there aren't really any major difference as far as the actual character of the sound, which isn't surprising. So, now for the fun part. I'm gonna cut these open and check out the differences on the inside. I've never actually been able to see the inside of an XLR cable, only through diagrams and things like that, so I'm pretty excited to check out all of their inner workings. Before we take a look at the insides of these XLR cables, let's go over a brief explanation of how the wiring in an XLR cable typically works. So an XLR cable has three pins on it. There's a ground, and then there's a hot and a cold signal, and those are copies of the same signal, and that's what creates what's referred to as a balanced cable. So an XLR is a balanced cable, and what that means is it's sending two copies of one signal. I have my one microphone and it's sending that audio signal twice. It gets summed at the beginning and as it travels down the cable, it takes those two pins and puts them at reverse polarity. So they're 180 degrees out of phase. And what that means is when it gets summed on the other end, any type of interference that might have got picked up along the way with radio signals and other types of interference that can happen along the run of the cable, when it gets to the other end of the cable, it gets summed again and and all of that gets eliminated because they were both 180 degrees out of phase. So it's a pretty cool little electrical thing that happens with XLR cables. All right, now let's start with the lowest end cable that we have here from Hosa. This is the MBL. It's also the thinnest cable at a 24 gauge cable. Took a look at the inside. I cut off the outer casing. You can see a look at it there. So it has this rubber casing or what's referred to, I think as typically being like a PVC type of material. And then we see right here, it has this copper wiring that's acting as our ground. So you can see that on the other end of the XLR cable, you look right here, you can kind of see it on that end of the cables. It's going to that pin and it's taking the copper wiring right there. You can see that thinnest part of the cable is it's taking that copper wiring and turning it into the ground. So that's what this little bit of copper wiring is doing right here, is acting as our ground. And then we have just a little bit of shielding. This is just a sort of thin little piece of foil or maybe some other type of material that's acting as this shielding, but not a whole bunch. And then these are our two different signal cables that are creating the different signal copies. So we have our hot and then we have our cold signal. And that makes up that cable. Now, let's take a look at the next cable in the lineup. This is the MCH cable. And if we see it right here, is the inside. You can see that there's a little bit more of that copper that's acting as the ground. It's actually a little bit more braided, whereas the other one wasn't really as much of a strong braid. This one definitely has more of that copper material. It also has this sort of paper and cotton that was wrapped around the cables um, that I think that's just helping fill out the middle so it helps it because it's a little bit of a thicker cable. This is a, a thicker gauge than the previous cable was. And then also we can see these are two signal cables, but they're wrapped with an extra black coating on it, which is also acting as a shield. So that helps give it a little bit more of a better shielding function to reject some of those EMI frequencies. All right, now let's look at the next one in the lineup. This is the HMIC cable. It has a pretty similar build quality to the previous cable that we looked at. It has this black PVC type material coating that's sort of a rubbery material material and then it's got that little bit more of that copper braiding again right there that's acting as the ground pin and then it's got that similar like paper plus a little bit of this sort of a like twine or I don't know some sort of a thread that goes through the middle of the cable and then we also have a similar amount of that shielding as well that we can see right here so that's that black shielding and then these are our two signal cables all right and now let's check out the highest end cable in the lineup that we have in front of us today this is the MSC cable so this one had the most substantial amount of this copper braiding on the outside that acts as the ground. I'm sure it helps a little bit with the shielding. This one also had this paper material on the outside of the copper along with our same sort of 
PVC rubber type of coating on the outside. We had more of this twine and or string type of stuff in the middle. And then we also had this shielding once again around the signal cables themselves. So they have their own extra amount of shielding for that uh, signal cable just to make sure it's really rejecting that EMI interference. So I think it was really interesting being able to look at the insides of all of these different cables that are made by the same company. So we got to see how they treat their different cables at different price points. And it definitely seemed like some of the bigger differences were between the amount of grounding and how the copper wiring was treated for the ground pin on those XLRs. I didn't really notice when I took them apart any substantial changes in the soldering on the ends for the pins. They all looked pretty similar. It wasn't really anything jumping out as like this one has a way stronger, way better soldering. They all looked pretty similar to my eyes. So when you're looking into what cables you should be buying, the most important thing is to take into consideration what you're gonna be using it for. The more permanent type of installations where you're not gonna be plugging and unplugging them a bunch, you're not gonna be wrapping the cable a whole bunch, it's really just gonna get plugged in and stay where it is, then you might not necessarily need a super high-end cable with a really good build quality since you're not really gonna be messing with the cable very much but you also just wanna consider what we talked about with the EMI interference as well. You maybe have something that does give off a lot of that electromagnetic interference and a lot of that electromagnetic type of signal. So you might need a higher end cable that has better rejection of that along the run of the cable so you're not gonna get any of that type of humming in your signal. And then finally is just being careful when you look at those price points. Because obviously like we showed at the very beginning of this video is sometimes there are those crazy prices and you wanna just be careful is that you should never be be paying any sort of crazy amounts of money for XLR cables. Those are usually one of the more affordable pieces of your audio equipment. So you just wanna make sure there's a lot of different manufacturers and a lot of different places that you can get XLR cables and just make sure you're looking into what those prices are and how much you're paying and finding a brand that you really like and has really served you well. That's it for this video. Hope it was helpful for you guys when you're looking for those XLR cables. If this was helpful and you were able to learn some things about your XLR cables, I would really appreciate it if you give this video a like and you hit that subscribe button and we'll see you in the next one.